the idea that, that women are on the one hand defined by their sexuality, but on the other hand not allowed to take agency and power over that, if that's something that they're putting a commercial price on, I don't know how you hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time. Unless you have like an incredibly sophisticated analysis of capitalism, right? Like that's mm. the thing that I think is also going on here is our anxieties about the way that all of our labor is commodified. Everything that we do in the world has a price on it. I think it's much easier to talk about how anxious that makes us feel and, and, and where our, our personhood and our intimacy is compromised by like being in the world and having to survive. Those anxieties, I feel like, get heaped on sex workers in this way that I don't see them heaped on other workers. My perspective is sex work is actually something that's primarily about economic activity. It's just something that we are told we are not supposed to put a price on. Hi, I'm Raihan Salam, and this is The Vice Podcast Show. I'm joined today by freelance journalist Melissa Jira Grand, author of Playing the Whore, The Work of Sex Work, Melissa, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Tell me about the central argument of the book. If I had to sum it up in one sentence, it would be that sex work is work. Um, and that's an incredibly controversial claim. For some reason, saying that something that people do for money and to survive, if what that thing is is sex or even just sexual fantasy, that is seen as something that we just aren't allowed to claim, right? That I, and I'm not sure why that is, and that's where the book sort of steps in to say, well, how did we get here? How is it that this particular kind of labor is treated separate from all other kinds of labor? And why is it that we have these myths about sex workers, particularly this myth that you know, nobody would ever sell sex unless they had no other choice? What, where do those come from? And also, who, who benefits from those myths? That idea of choice seems really important because it's easy for me to imagine one counterargument, which is that if we had uh, unconditional basic income, if we had some way for women to have greater security in their work, uh, other kinds of work, other than sex work, uh, then you know people wouldn't be forced into this kind of work. And yet, what you're suggesting is that that's not quite the issue. God, I wish people who argue against sex work would then say everyone should have universal basic income and full employment because that would be a totally different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I actually would love to have it, but I feel like that's not but often. You still have a conversation. I mean, it, that wouldn't be the end of the conversation. No, for I don't. You. I don't think. I don't think. I mean, it's a very fascinating sort of way to flip it around and say, like, well, would there be sex work after the revolution, right? Like, people ask me this, or would, there, in your feminist utopia or your progressive utopia, would there, would people still exchange sex um, for for something? You know, whether that, you know, maybe it wouldn't be money anymore. I don't know what it would be, um, but I think that, you know, there there is something historic about the exchange of sex for goods that certainly predates capitalism. And there's also something about the way that sex work functions under capitalism, which is for people who don't have access to other kinds of employment, there is almost no barrier to entry. And it's something that people who historically don't have a lot of power to you know, move through education systems or to you know, get jobs in the traditional economy. It is something that is there for people where when other things have failed them. So it's sort of a stopgap for people in a really treacherous economic system. And I think that's like the much more interesting way to look at it rather than saying like, well, what are the necessary conditions we would have to create to get rid of this thing? It's like, well, that necessary conditions actually don't have a lot to do with sexual desire. I think they have to do with the constraints of our economy and how people have to survive within it. I guess what I'm trying to get at is you even, yeah, after the revolution, I mean, sort of part of what you seem to be defending is the legitimacy of people being able to make the choice to make this kind of exchange. Is that a fair characterization of your I think, view? I think that's fair. I mean, I, I'm sometimes wary of talking about choice and consent in very simplistic ways mm. because I think that we don't often talk about other kinds of work um, through the lens of choice and consent. Like, I feel like we would like to believe that everyone does what they do for a living because they enjoy it and it's absolutely what they would love to be doing, but we also know that for most people work is what they do in order to survive. It's not necessarily the expression of their highest self, you know, this sort of like do what you love fantasy that we're all just following our passion projects. Um, so it's hard for me to, to separate sex work out from yeah. that reality, but I think that what we have to understand is that people make the best choices among often very limited options that might be in front of them. And so I what I don't want to do is say sex work is okay if it's freely chosen because I think that it's not really up to us to say which work is okay and which work isn't okay. That's not necessarily the right question. I think the question is how are people being treated? Do people feel safe? Do people have access to what they need in this cho in, within these limited choices that they're making? And how can we expand the choices that they have? Let's talk about 
the ideas of exploitation and empowerment because when people talk about sex work it seems that we either you know want you know are you saying that these women are empowered in every single instance or we're saying that they're exploited and it sounds to me like you're you don't think that that binary quite fits no, and particularly because it's it seems like a double standard that's applied to sex mm -hmm. workers where, you know, even even some progressives will say like, well, I, you know, if sex workers, if they're feeling empowered and they're making like a feminist choice or they're doing like ethical porn or they're doing like, you know, the, the Whole Foods version of running a sex toy store, I'm okay with that. It's just this gross exploitive stuff over here that I don't like. And I feel like you can't do that. Like mm. you, you either support people's ability to do what they have to do to take care of themselves and take control of themselves of how that's going to look, right? Um, but I don't think that it necessarily serves us to start dividing people up into classes of like, well, these are the empowered people and these are the exploited people over here. Even people who love their job can experience exploitation. And even people who are experiencing exploitation still have power and choice and control in their lives. And so I think it's, you know, we have to get like a lot closer to the realities of people's lives and also the diversity of those experiences among sex workers rather than making these big generalizations that might make us feel very comfortable as people who aren't doing sex work but actually have very little resemblance to the kinds of things that sex workers face day to day. When you talk about the um, movement for wages for um, household work and what have you, I'm interested in this idea of trying to separate economic activity from other kinds of activity. The idea that you know there's this thing called the household, and within the household, the household is supposed to be sacrosanct, and it's supposed to be you know outside of the space of you know kind of commerce and messiness and exchange. Are you suggesting that are you suggesting that there isn't such a thing as, as these kind of totally autonomous spheres, and that that's just kind of like a misleading way to think about it? I mean, I think that anybody who was working from home you know, and not having their work recognized as work, like housewives would dispute, you know, that the home is this private place where no commerce happens. And I think also our culture is shifting as more and more people are like home based in their work. Like I think we'll start to lose that notion of like our home is the place that's the opposite of work, um, that's our private space. It's, it's also something incredibly gendered, right? The idea that work is something that happens outside and is public facing and everything that happens inside is like private. The inside the home gets coded as feminine, the outside the home gets coded as masculine. And you know, I think that's part of the reason sex work actually was stigmatized historically is because sex workers were visible and present in public spaces participating in commerce in ways that women weren't supposed to. So one way of thinking about this, I guess, is the idea that if you think of this as a space of economic activity, you can think of this as almost a kind of solidaristic gesture. You know, we're trying to protect the value of this group of women, let's say the good women or the kind of good sexual beings, uh, and to protect their value, their perceived value, uh, you know, you have to attack these other people who are engaging in a different kind of exchange. Right. Is that, do you think that that kind of fits? I mean, I feel like that, until about 100 years ago was really the rationale for a lot of, of anti-sex work policing and policy. You know, you go back to the ancient Near East and you'll see that prostitution wasn't necessarily tolerated, um, but there was a, an articulation in, in early kind of legal code that there were different classes of sex workers, um, that they didn't call themselves sex workers at the time. There were actually different names for all these different classes of women who traded sex. And that some were allowed to work here, and some were allowed to work here, some were, could be on this part of town, some could do this kind of work in a temple, some had to work in a beer hall. Like The idea of segregation goes so deep in, in how sex work has been regulated throughout history. Um, but the idea of who that person is, like how we think of a sex worker um, in relationship to the rest of women, that's something that's changed very recently. And so what you'll see in, in the US in the last 100 years or so is a shift from people saying, you know, sex workers are, or prostitutes are, if you wanna go back um, to like the turn of the last century before the term sex work was really in usage, you would have a group of people that had thought, been thought of as sort of like, a, they had moral failing, they, they were fallen women, they were, they were women who, you know, it somehow personally within themselves they had committed some sin or had become corrupt. And there was a shift 
towards thinking of this group of women as people who actually the corruption came from outside. They were forced into this by the social forces around them that tempted them or led them astray or something like that. So we see this like new kind of character of the prostitute as victim versus this fallen person. But I would say that's actually no great benefit either. Like where is there space for someone who sells sex because this is something that they're deciding to do. This is a rational choice. Um, and that even if it's not the thing that they would most love doing, like, well, let's look at the other choices available to them 100 years ago. Let's look at the other things that they could do to survive. Um, and the other thing that this does also is it gives those good women a job. So uh, Laura Augustin, an anthropologist, talks about the group of women who then rushed in into that void to save those women. She describes them as the rescue industry. Um, so now they can set up charitable homes and orphanages and service projects in order to save those women from themselves. So if there is ever a more clear kind of um, illustration of that binary between like the women who need to be saved and the women who do the saving, that's really when we see it. And in fact, we haven't moved on very far from that now. You know, now the group of women who are doing the saving might identify themselves as anywhere from a evangelical Christian woman in a megachurch who has a small missionary project where she's trying to you know, go to strip clubs and tell women about Christ and how they'll be saved. Or she might identify herself as a very progressive feminist working inside a large global NGO, you know, out there creating programs to rehabilitate prostitutes. So there's a lot of different people who are invested in this idea of saving prostitutes from themselves, even, you know, now 100 years after this, this project started and, you know, has had pretty much no impact on the sex industry, to be honest. So you were telling me that even after various efforts to, um, you know, reframe the debate to say that, you know, we're not opposed to women who are doing sex work. We are trying to, for example, let's say we're trying to target the demand. I mean, this is, you know, a big part of the conversation now around sex work. Um, you know, we're the allies of these women who are exploited in various ways. You don't think that's made any meaningful difference? I think if it, what, what is the difference, right? Is the difference going to be described as a difference in the amount of prostitution that people see in their daily lives? Is the difference going to be defined by women who don't want to be doing sex work now have other jobs that they can do? Um, is the difference going to be defined by there are more charitable organizations rescuing sex workers than there had been 10 years ago? Like, who gets to define what success here is? And so very rarely are sex workers actually consulted and asked to say, here's what the help I need would look like. Right? That, that's where I distinguish these helping projects from projects that are actually run by sex workers who are meeting their own needs and other people are working in support of that. That's, that's where I would say there hasn't actually been much difference. The real difference has been in those projects that sex workers are running themselves. So that's the kind of thing that requires people to actually respect sex workers as people who have choice and agency, not just in their sex work, but in all of their lives. And that's the kind of choice and agency that I think is really constrained by saying, we're gonna come in and save you from sex work, that's your problem. And to have a sex worker then turn around and say, fine, you took me out of this brothel, now what? Right now, what happens in my life? What am I supposed to do after this? You know, the, the problem in my life wasn't just the sex industry. The problem in my life was poverty, not having a doctor, not having an education. What are you going to do about that? Uh, some years ago, the journalist Carrie Howley uh, wrote an article about sex trafficking in which she observed that in many cases you saw women uh, actually returning after having been rescued, quote unquote, uh, to where they had been before, partly because in some cases it seems they had more agency than kind of had been conventionally understood. And, and we see that in the United States as well. So there's a, a project right now operating in Arizona called Project Rose, where they actually, a group of social workers who are based at Arizona State University are working with local law enforcement to do more prostitution stings, to go out and target more women that they believe um, are doing prostitution, whether they are or not, handcuff them, put them in a police car, and then take them to this church where they meet outreach workers who tell them, if you cooperate with us, if you go into this program, um, we won't file these charges against you. But the program that they're offering them is something run by the Catholic Charities that basically you know, addresses them as a victim of the sex industry. And, and there's nothing that program is doing that actually provides people with the kinds of things they would need, even if they wanted to leave sex work in order to do so. It's, it's counseling and therapy. And, um, and you know, if you do think that sex work is the kind of thing that someone would only do if they were incredibly damaged, then yes, you might think what they need is counseling and therapy, but that's not the reality of what people are presenting as the different issues that they're facing. So absolutely, it doesn't surprise me that people have, you know, after they've been through these dramatic rescues, return to sex work if you're not providing them another option. So you talk a lot about 
the specific ways in which the police are interacting with sex workers. Uh, and you know, I think that the police are there to you know, protect the broader society. Uh, and when you're thinking about these laws that are you know, being reconceived uh, of as protecting uh, sex workers as opposed to protecting Johns, uh, how has this worked in practice? Because in theory, that sounds like an interesting idea. You know, at the very least, if you're shifting the legal burden uh, to the John and away from the sex worker, you know, then the idea is that, well, perhaps then sex workers will be more comfortable coming to the police uh, if they're abused in various ways. Uh, but, but your sense is that this has, hasn't actually worked in practice. No, and, and the numbers also bear that out. I mean, the the thing that's that's troubling for me about these these projects, they're variously called like end demand projects, or um, some of them are projects that describe themselves as bringing the Nordic model into practice, which is sort of a misnomer. There's been an anti-prostitution law in Sweden since 1999 that Sweden was a country that didn't actually criminalize selling sex, and so it introduced criminal penalties to buying sex. Um, that's not our legal situation in the United States, where pretty much everything that has to do with selling and buying sex is criminalized. So. You know, when you when people talk about, oh no, 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 I don't want to, you know, criminalize sex workers, we're just going to go after the demand. There there's a lot of um, assumptions in that. And I think that actually when we look at how policing plays out in the real world, they diverge significantly. You can't say we're only going to criminalize this group of people and not this group of people who must interact with one another for sex work to occur without introducing police into the equation. So what we see in Sweden is that police are now tasked with still doing surveillance of sex workers' workplaces, which in some cases are their homes. That can result in landlords not wanting to rent apartments to sex workers. That can result in sex workers having to work on the street in much more dangerous situations. So there are ways that this actually creates harm and blows back onto sex workers, even if it's getting you know framed and talked about to the public as, oh, well, we're just going after these people. But I would, I would walk it back even further than that and say, like, well, wait a minute. You know, this is economic activity, and you're still treating this as a crime. If you want to give sex workers the ability to report crimes to the police, um, then create amnesty for them so that they don't feel like they have to come forward and risk getting arrested themselves. You don't need to place criminal penalties on everybody who buys sex if what you're concerned with is people who are abusive. There are already laws against rape, abuse, kidnapping, all of these other things that are supposedly what you're trying to protect sex workers from. So why are you introducing more criminal penalties? Why are you giving police more opportunities to come between sex workers and their own safety? It doesn't make any sense. When you, particularly when you look at, you know, this, especially in the United States, our history of racial profiling and policing, particularly gender profiling that targets transgender women, you know, we can't say that we're going to put the police out there to go after the demand without also exposing all of those people to the criminal legal system without a lot of recourse. These aren't people um, who necessarily are going to be able to fight their charges. And you know, we just saw this in New York, the head of the Super Bowl. There were dozens of women who were picked up in prostitution stings, even though theoretically the, the aim of the NYPD was to go after the demand. Um, but that's not what happened. That's not who they arrested. And that's not who has a criminal record now because of that. Tell me, uh, so you, in the course of covering sex work, the sex work industry, you've interacted with many sex workers over time. and I. I'd love to know more about how sex workers see their work. I mean, I feel like, you know, and this has happened to me too because I'm open about having been a sex worker. People will say like, oh, this is obviously what I want you to talk about, right? This is the thing that distinguishes you from other people because you have this insider knowledge. And what I would start with there is saying like, my own experiences don't necessarily represent the experiences of other people who've done sex work. And, and that's, I think it's tantalizing to believe that, um, the, you know, sex workers all have this sort of one thing that happens to them that makes them choose to do sex work or that, you know, all of their experiences in sex work are defined by something that, you know, safely keeps them other from the rest of us, to be honest. Um, and so I find that like a very difficult question to answer because there's no, there's no common experience that unites everybody's workplaces. Workplaces themselves are incredibly diverse. The kinds of labor that you're exchanging are incredibly diverse. I mean, if you have, on the one hand, people doing webcam work out of their own apartments. On the other hand, you have people doing escorting going into hotels. You have people working on the street, which is, you know, reducing more and more over time, I think, but particularly because police are so focused on policing the streets that that's actually moved more of sex work indoors. So, you know, the, what people believe sex work even looks like, this like interaction happening on the street. It really doesn't actually resemble most of what sex workers' work lives feel like. I understand why people want to know. Like I want to be like empathetic to that, yeah. but I also feel like it's not really the point. 
you know, the point is, what are the common experiences that they have because of the other systems in their lives? Um, and that's why criminalization and policing are really one of my focuses, because I feel like we take for granted that there couldn't even be a sex industry without police policing it. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. And so that's why I put my focus on those actors and say, these are the people who actually have a huge stake in shaping the conditions of sex work. It's not just sex workers and their own relationship to their work or their sexuality, or even to their customers, that, you know, it's the police, it's politicians, it's the media. These are the people I want to know. Where do they get their ideas about sex work? Because they've never done it, most of them. And if they have, they're not talking about it. When you talk about the evolution of the sex work industry uh, in response to changing police tactics, uh, uh, I wonder, let's talk a little bit about that, about the idea of the kind of shrinking spaces in cities in which this can take place. So, you know, when you're looking at the evolution of policing in you know, U.S. cities, one thing you've seen is this idea that open-air drug markets are a bad thing. Uh, they're a bad thing because they create a perception of disorder and much else. And so the fact that, you know, in a city like New York and many other cities like it, you now have um, delivery services mm -hmm. in which, you know, you call someone, they will come with a pizza box, and inside will be marijuana or whatever else you might Just say. crave. Just yeah. Say. Now, Tell me about, so, so you know, the, the logic there is that, well, you know, kind of rather than have this kind of public disorder, we move it into the home and that makes it a kind of safer, more manageable kind of experience. So even though people are still using the drug, you know, perhaps there's some advantage to this. What do you think of, about an analogous argument about sex work that, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, it's moved to the internet from these kind of public spaces, in some cases, not all, mm -hmm. that this might actually um, improve the uh, situation for sex workers potentially? I think there's a lot of pros and cons with mm -hmm. it. And one of the, the cons is that, you know, it's, it's creating these class divides within the sex industry where the people who are facing the lion's share of the stigma and the people who are facing the lion's share of the policing are people who don't have access to those indoor spaces to work or who have chosen not to for whatever reason. You know, might prefer a more casual kind of work style where they're on the street and just doing as much work as they need to and then going home. Would never dream of having their photo on the internet because that's just not something that they want to, to follow them around for the rest of their lives, right? So these what are opportunities for people to take more power and control over their work, you know, advertising online, only working behind closed doors, being incredibly discreet about their work so that maybe even no one else in their life knows that they're doing it. They, they, can, they don't necessarily benefit everybody. So, you know, in, in, in the model of kind of the phone drug service, that doesn't mean that corner drug dealing has totally stopped. It mm. just changes who is doing the corner drug dealing versus, you know, probably the nice college kids at home, the yuppies at home calling in for the phone service. So those people could be more marginal and thus more endangered than exactly. the people who are not you know, migrating to the internet. Exactly. You know, this is something that um, is one of the consequences of, of this gentrification that, you know, isn't just hitting the sex industry, it's, it's hitting, you know, lots of different kinds of work. And the idea of like upscaling work to make it more socially acceptable is something that, you know, I definitely hear sex workers themselves talking about. It's like my business actually represents a massage therapist business. It doesn't look at anything at all about what's happening on the street. So even, you know, among groups of sex workers, people can have stigma and stereotypes about, you know, what makes their business acceptable versus somebody else's business. Um, but it, it all comes down to, to power and privilege, to be honest, and, and what kinds of resources you have available to take care of your business. The reality is indoor working sex workers just aren't as likely to experience police harassment and violence. They're just not as likely to get arrested. Um, but when they are targeted for arrest, you know, if you're working on the street and you're working with a group of sex workers on the street and police harass you, chances are there's somebody else there that you already know who's gonna witness that interaction. If you're working by yourself in a hotel room, I found these videos that the Fargo Police Department had posted online um, of their own undercover surveillance in hotel rooms where they were variously posing as sex workers and as customers of sex workers. So there you are in a hotel room completely by yourself, disrobed with somebody from law enforcement who's represented themselves to be a customer and now has handcuffed you and put you in a chair and said, okay, now we're gonna interrogate you. Um, that can also feel a lot scarier than an interaction on the street where at least there are people there who have your back. So in the Scandinavian countries, it's commonplace to have tax records be entirely public. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just kind of go to a, a public index and look up exactly how much paid, what their taxable income was in a given year. Um, I think that for many Americans, that idea would seem completely appalling and totally crazy. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a, a neat reminder of how the things that are considered public and private, that are considered kind of intimate or, or, or sort of, you know, or not, uh, you know, just vary so sharply from society to society. And much of what you're talking about, about the regulation of sex work, to me just seems to raise questions about all economic activity. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, if the idea is that, well, look, 
when you try to say, we'll register sex workers, we will allow them to work in this specific kind of way, we will not allow them to work in this kind of way, so that necessarily means there's going to be regulation and policing. Uh, it necessarily means that some people who choose to work in this kind of way are going to kind of get the brunt of that kind of attention. But does that, does that not apply to other modes of, of economic activity too? It can, but we tend not to bring the criminal legal system in as the mm -hmm. regulator, right? I mean, we can look to New Zealand, uh, which has decriminalized prostitution, and the body of laws and policies around it are civil, not criminal. Um, so, and there are restrictions there about, you know, where you can advertise and the content of advertising, um, but they're also incredibly minimal, and they are much more on par with other kinds of regulations for other kinds of businesses that are considered legitimate businesses. Um, you know, we could have a whole other conversation about what kinds of criminal practices Practices and what kinds of workplaces are, tend to involve the police coming to your door and raiding you, and you know how much more likely it is to be raided if you're uh, a sex worker versus if you are a banker who's broken the law. Um, I don't necessarily think that we should be increasing criminal penalties around sex work because people are concerned about um, you know the impact of it in their communities. Like New Zealand has shown that there is a way to do this that doesn't actually require us to further involve law enforcement and to even further expose people like through these things like forced registries and things like that. Mm. Um, I was just looking at a story in Italy where sex work there is, uh, prostitution is not criminal, um, but prostitutes are not allowed to pay tax and have actually been um, protesting, demanding the right to pay their taxes, to have their tax money collected because their work isn't considered legitimate. And so they have these tax bills, but they have absolutely no way to pay them. And I thought that was just fascinating. Well, I'm really puzzled by this. Tell me a little bit more about uh, how this works. So they're not allowed to pay, but they have this liability. Literally, we're being liability. turned away when they tried to pay their tax bills. Um, and, and so there was actually a nude protest outside of like the tax collectors, I think in Milan in the last week or so, and now it's starting to get some media attention. But they're saying like, look, if, if what you think what we do is real work, then like, let us, let us participate in the economy, I see, I see. right? And this is one of the consequences of the, the Swedish uh, law. You would have thought that that would have attracted lots of people. Into At sex a time work when many other not, people yeah, are, are quite standing happy up to not pay taxes, but yeah, and saying like, you know, no, we don't want to, we don't want to pay taxes in this economy because we can't afford them. And and this is the other thing that you know I, I tend to get from libertarians who are like, yes, let's tax it, regulate it. Um, it's like, aren't you aware that sex workers are already paying tax even when things are criminalized? You know, like the amount of income generated by. Um, advertisements on websites, the amount of income generated by buying hotel rooms, airfare, clothing, like all of the associated expenses with sex work, that is taxable. Like people are participating in the economy. And I think it's just our, our um, you know, inability to regard what they're doing as actually work and still want to bring these criminal penalties. Like people don't even stop and think, well, isn't there another way to have a safe workplace? Like, you know, what is the role of OSHA? What is the role of other kinds of bodies that we have that are supposed to protect people at work? And to put this in the greater context of how few workers in the United States actually feel like that they could take control of that, that they could get representation at their workplace to demand what they want. Um, like, I love that sex workers are being held to this higher standard of like fair workplaces. Like, I wish everybody had access to that. Um, but it's, it feels a little disingenuous to say like, this is such a uniquely unruly industry that we have to have the police involved in regulating it. It's like, I can think of a lot of unruly industries right now that have done a lot more damage to us than sex work. Mm. Um, and there's been little to any police involvement in, in regulating those. Turning back to this idea of uh, the idea of a, a distinction between good people and non-good people, it's sort of like you know people who merit some kind of protection and those who don't merit some kind of protection. You know, it occurs to me when you're talking about the idea of um, public, um, the public sale of sex, um, you know, one thing that we've heard a lot about in the culture recently um, is the idea of slut shaming. Mm -hmm. And you introduced an interesting distinction between slut shaming and, and whore stigma. But just briefly, I just kind of want to throw out this idea you know, as a man, um, you know, in the United States, uh, I feel as though oh, I haven't experienced a ton of um, objectification in like the real world, walking around the street, uh, having personally. people, me yeah. personally, having, you know, kind of like people regulate my behavior by saying that, hey, you're not smiling. You ought to, you know, this kind of thing that right, I right. think is very commonplace for other kinds of people. And it occurs to me that, you know, that seems like such um, a kind of offense to one's personhood. And I wonder like how much of, uh, of this kind of um, anger and resentment comes from that, just this idea that, 
hey, when you behave this way, then it shapes how people treat me, mm -hmm. you know, or it, shape, it regulates how I'm allowed to present myself. Because, you know, if this way of presenting myself is then associated uh, with taking part in this kind of economic activity, then, you know, I'm suddenly stigmatized by this. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it feels like a collective form of victim blaming, though, mm -hmm. right? And part of a larger problem with respectability politics. You know, like, you know, if you think about it outside the context of, of sex and gender for a second, and you, you think of it in the context of race, and the way that men of color, particularly black men, are told to appear, you know, control their appearance in a certain way so that they, like, in some cases, literally won't get shot by people who would otherwise be targeting them. And then that's generalized to all young black men and say, oh, if you conduct yourselves this way, you're gonna be able to protect yourself from the George Zimmermans of the world who probably don't actually distinguish between whether you're wearing a hoodie or not. Like, I think it's very, easy when we just talk about it around sexuality and gender to think it's just about like personal expression. Um, but this actually has to do with how people feel safe in moving in the world. And, and that, you know, the level of violence and harassment that people can face um, based on how people are approaching them on the street, based on the kinds of comments they hear just on the way to the train. Um, you know, it's, it is very tantalizing to think if I can control my behavior, this just won't happen to me. And then to extend out from there, and if those other people also control this behavior, it wouldn't happen to them. And then they wouldn't, other people wouldn't think that I, you can talk to me that way, right? And it doesn't actually work that way. It takes all of the focus off of the actual perpetrator, which are people who believe they can walk around the world with impunity and harass people and be violent towards people based on their race and their gender and their appearance. And it's, you know, I understand the desire from having, um, you know, before, before I was a journalist working in, in victim services, working in a rape crisis center, um, and, and hearing people sort of process, um, you know, how rape on campus affected them. And I would hear the same kinds of arguments of like, well, if she didn't go to that party and she didn't wear that thing, if she, this didn't happen, you know, if she didn't do those things, then this wouldn't have happened to her. And I look at horse stigma as, as sort of a form of victim blaming in the same way, that, except it's like much more broad instead of just saying this is about me. It's saying this what group is of horse women. Stigma? Yeah. Well, horse stigma is, um, it's not just, you know, the, the fear of being perceived as a whore. Um, but it's this whole kind of you know, system of social interactions that we uphold with one another so that we maintain that the whore is absolutely the worst thing that you could ever be as a woman. Um, and it's not just about being a woman, you know, like there, what, is, what are the kinds of stereotypes we hear about, about, um, about whores or sluttish women? They're, they're too much, they're excessive. Uh, there's ways that, that whore stigma impacts women of color in particular that I think are very different than the ways they impact white women. Like I saw this around Slut Walk that, you know, there were white women who participated in things like Slut Walk and said, oh, this is great, this is empowering, I'm owning my sexuality in public. And, and black women in particular saying, I was never presumed, I was always presumed to be a slut just because I'm a black woman. I don't necessarily have the power to claim that in public in the same way that you do. Um, and so that's why I, I, I prefer using whore stigma as a way to understand this than just slut shaming because I think it, it points a little more specifically to all the different ways that sex and gender and race and class interact and the ways that we say which women are valuable, which women are going to be the targets of violence, and which women we care about when they are targets of violence. When you talk about slut shaming in the book, you talk about the idea that you know, there's this hidden premise that there is such a thing as a slut that we can then um, stigmatize in various ways. Is that a fair it, that, That's some, one of the limitations, I think, with slut shaming is it's sort of, you know, there's sometimes at the core of it, not all the time, but when people call it out, there's sometimes this sense of like, don't you dare call me a slut, I would never be a slut, right? And I think the, the, the premise that needs to be challenged is like, well, why is there this character? Why is there this outsider woman who, based on whatever choices she made or whatever assumptions we make about her, is deserving of that behavior? And I think that if we look at this instead through the, the lens of horse stigma, we see that actually there's quite a lot of misogyny and patriarchy and white supremacy is propped up by this idea of the Jezebel, the whore, the bad woman that bad things happened to and she brought them on herself. And that's the idea that should be challenged, not the behavior of those people. Since you've been engaged in these debates around how we talk about sex work and um, you know, how we value sex workers and their voices, do you feel as though there's been a moving of the needle? Do you feel like the conversation around this has changed at, all, at least in some communities? I think it's, there's two things that are going on around it that feel very exciting to me. One is that as the anti-prostitution movement gets much more focused on, on this, this in demand or Nordic model kind of policy adoption, and they're pushing for this in Canada now, they're pushing for it right now in the EU, um, 
that as they do that, I feel like in some ways they're sort of overstepping um, their own capacity to pass those laws. And they're creating opportunities for sex workers to be very vocal and to oppose what they're doing. Um, I just saw on the way over here, there's a, uh, MP, a uh, member of, of European Parliament with the wonderful name Mary Honeyball. And, uh, and she is the proponent of the Nordic model right now in the EU. And in the last week, sex workers organizations appealed to NGOs saying, please stand against this with us. Please you know, show your support for how this law is actually going to harm a lot of people. And they got almost 600 NGOs to sign on opposing the Nordic model being adopted in the EU. And Mary Honeyball's response today in an email to the EU was, those organizations are all run by pimps. So the, just the idea that there even could be opposition to what they are doing is so unfathomable that she has to just categorize all those organizations, which, by the way, are leading HIV organizations, International Planned Parenthood Foundation. Very surprised, I'm it sure, to find out they're run very, by pimps. It speaks to a, a, an enormous sophistication on the part of this international pimp network. Exactly. They're, mm -hmm. they're in NGOs. They're very highly placed. Mm -hmm. You know, they're using sex workers' money to buy themselves seats at the UN. I mean, I, who knows yeah. how far it goes, right? <laughs> You know, one of the things that's happening with this really kind of strong ideological anti-prostitution push, like with Mary Honeyball in the EU, is that they're, they're, they're having to go to such lengths to state their positions that they're just like laying their anti-prostitution cards on the table. Like they're not just saying like, oh no, these policies are gonna protect women. They've departed from that. And now they're saying things like, oh, these organizations that support sex workers, no, they're actually run by pimps. So not only is it that pimps apparently force people into sex work, but they're also forcing sex workers into advocacy. It doesn't make a lot of sense. They're trying to delegitimate alternative points of view, I guess. Exactly, like the idea that, that people could dissent. The idea that the people they're trying to protect might not actually want that form of protection, like it's just so inconceivable that now they have to stigmatize those people for speaking up. Uh, but the reality is there's 600 organizations nearly signing on saying, no, we, we don't support this. And so I think that actually, the, the louder they are getting about their anti-prostitution position, it's actually giving people opportunities to come in from the other side and say, what you're doing doesn't seem like it's protecting women. It seems like you're just shouting over them and giving them, you know, you're dictating their behavior in a way that you're not actually asking them what they need. One thing when you're talking about sex work, you know, it's obviously a subject that is people find very provocative. Uh, it just elicits intense emotions. It, it elicits intense emotions that are oftentimes confusing and conflicting because people who think of themselves as one way find this kind of clashing with their sensibilities. Is that what drew you to it as a young person? Is it just the fact that it seems so transgressive and kind of? I don't know. I mean, I think at the, the time of my life when I first had exposure to the idea that there were women in the world who sold sex, I cannot honestly remember when that was. But I think that the time in my life when I first realized that this was a controversial topic came much later. You know, like I feel like we're, we're ha we have to taught we have to be taught to think that um, that these things are like outsider identities. Like I do remember being raised as a as a kid to be modest, right, and and being given messages about sexuality that sex is private and should be something that we only share with people that we love. Um, but if I was taught anything about sex at all as a kid, right? I mean, this is also like an incredibly taboo topic for even parents to broach. And you know, this is also the 90s. It's the era of AIDS being really present um, in the lives of young people. So I feel like I got a lot of conflicting messages than most people do. Yeah. Um, but none of them really had anything to do with like sex work in particular. Like it was all equally controversial. Like all of the things I was obsessed with at that time. Well, I grew up in the 90s and I feel like the negotiation of intimacy and the idea of consent and what that means and how we define it was really present then. And I mm -hmm. feel like it's, I just kind of feel like just as a kid, I mean, watching Saturday Night Live, making jokes about the Antioch rules and the idea that right. as you escalate, you know, you should seek permission for every step. And just, I feel like I really took it in in a very deep kind of way, but I feel like we were very confused as a culture about some of confused these issues. Confused and also like rapidly talking about it, right? Like, I mean, I think by the time I finally got to, to Foucault later in life, understanding that, right, like we aren't a culture that's um, afraid of talking about sex. We obsessively talk about sex and we obsessively talk about how sex is hard to talk about at the same time. Yeah. So there's so many things happening um, around the discourse of sexuality that, you know, it's like on the one hand, we're not supposed to talk about it. On the other hand, we're like obsessed with, with processing it. I remember yeah. watching Saturday Night Live in that era and seeing their parody of the Clarence Thomas um, hearings and, and having Chris Rock come in as like Long Dong Silver and like, you know, hearing about porn and watching the, the, these actors playing senators. I think Al Franken was one of them now, yeah. an actual senator, which is also bizarre oh, as children of yeah. the 90s. But like watching them like, 
really want to ask graphic sexual questions. I mean, that was the joke of it. It's like they can't stop themselves, and yet this is supposedly the most scandalous thing to talk about. But yeah. now we have this entire hearing about it, and everyone's watching it at home. I remember yeah. that too. Well, just the idea that there are these things we all know about, and these things that we're all familiar with, yet somehow we're not. Somehow we're decorous, and we don't talk about these things, despite the fact that they're, we kind of treat them as common knowledge. That's... And it's particularly preposterous with the internet. And yeah. this is one of the things that uh, I think we get wrong when we talk about sex work and the internet is the idea that the internet is normalizing sex work. It's like putting it in people's faces because it's everywhere. But I think that that's not quite the whole story. Like I think what it is is it's allowing people who have no exposure to sex work in their um, their day-to-day -day lives, who might not know anybody who does sex work, themselves don't employ sex workers, they can peep into the sex industry online yeah. and feel a closeness to it and feel like it is not so different and yet at the same time maintain a kind of distance and you know just close the browser and move on with their lives in a way that you know feels quite different than people's stereotypes about sex workers as oh I can tell who a prostitute is that's that woman who's you know standing on that corner or leaning into that car and you, we can't live with those stereotypes and believe them to be true anymore because there is just so much more evidence to the contrary. Yeah, it's kind of like enacting these scripts that become so powerful that it's actually the script that we wind up policing instead of, I mean, we don't even know what we're policing. Well, we make policy based on the script, yeah. right? And that doesn't actually hold up to reality. So, you know, the way that, that prostitution was policed even 100 years ago, like the, that's about the era of which our laws are based. And so to take laws from that moment in time when prostitution looked one way and to apply them in the current era, it doesn't really make any sense. But our stereotypes haven't necessarily advanced very much. You know, there was this amazing article in 2005 in The Onion, uh, in the satirical news magazine. And it was about a sex for security scam in which a woman was arrested. And what was her crime? Her crime was being a housewife. That is someone who is trading, you know, kind of like a man's wage uh, for security. Uh, and the th so the article was funny, but it was also kind of like, gosh, like, In that really close to home kind of way. Yeah, I was like, like, maybe I didn't what's so funny about, about this? this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So tell me, I mean, what's your reaction to that kind of thesis, this idea of collapsing the housewife into this space of sex work? I mean, it's something that's very tempting because it allows us to look at sex work as something that's primarily about sex. Right. Whereas my perspective is sex work is actually something that's primarily about economic activity. It's just something that we are told we are not supposed to put a price on. So the housewife is an interesting example because, you know, the actual origins of sex worker organizing in the United States was this moment where the wages for housework campaign was something that was sort of in the feminist consciousness, which was this idea of politicizing the labor of a housewife, saying that, you know, actually this is the work that's happening behind closed doors that allows everything else in our economic system to continue. This is the unpaid work of raising children, the unpaid work of making a nice home for the man to come home to at the end of the day. Without that work, where would other work be? This is actually essential work. And so it was a way of making something that we take for granted and something that's invisible, very visible to people. And I look at sex work in a similar way where we're supposed to never, ever, ever actually declare what a market value for sexuality would be. But I think that's like also a very abstract way of thinking of sex work. I think for most people, it actually falls much more on a continuum of other kinds of service work, where they have a particular skill set, or simply just their time that they're offering to somebody, and then they're figuring out a way to construct a business around that, however informal that might be. And I think that part of what you're saying about sex work is that, yeah, the fact that we're not allowed to talk about the value of these things kind of means that we're allowed to constrain and control them in different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the regulation of sex work and the policing of sex workers has to do with protecting what we imagine to be this totally separate class of women, right? This group of women who are the good women, the marriageable women. Even though that notion itself, I think, is like, really collapsing. Like most feminists wouldn't say, I'm, I'm here to protect a kind of sexual purity, right? I'm here to say that women's value is dictated by their sexual behavior. I think that most progressives would say that that's a really outmoded way of looking at things. Um, but when it comes to sex work, where it's the, the most literal value you could actually place on something, that scene is like so extra dehumanizing and ultra bad for not just the individual, but for society, because it somehow speaks to you know, how little we value women. Um, it, they don't really they don't really fit well together, right? I think one sort of shows that the other is, um, Sorry, let me just back up for a second. Like the, the idea that, that women are on the one hand defined by their sexuality, but on the other hand not allowed to take agency and power over that, if that's something that they're putting a commercial price on, 
I don't know how you hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time, unless you have like an incredibly sophisticated analysis of capitalism, right? Like that's yeah. the thing that I think is also going on here is our anxieties about the way that all of our labor is commodified. Everything that we do in the world has a price on it. I think it's much easier to talk about how anxious that makes us feel and, and, and where our, our personhood and our intimacy is compromised by like being in the world and having to survive. Those anxieties, I feel like, get heaped on sex workers in this way that I don't see them heaped on other workers. People aren't out there saving the waitresses from the flirtations they experience in the restaurant industry, right? Like, there's something about this group of people, and I would argue it's because sex workers have historically been very disenfranchised and disempowered. And it's very easy to make these broad generalizations about a group of people who don't necessarily have the capacity to speak back. As a journalist, what are some of the stories you're keen to cover going forward? Are there other questions in and around sex work uh, that, you know, and having written this book, um, that you want to explore further? Are there other? I'm really fascinated with the religious right in the United States um, and really fascinated with how uh, prostitution and sex trafficking, as they define it, uh, has become sort of a woman's issue for the religious right and for evangelicals in particular. So one of the things I was shocked by when I uh, was covering a protest outside the Village Voice where uh, Backpage at the time was owned and operated by Village Voice Media or the, the company broke up in some interesting way to sort of segregate the sex ads. But at the time, that the sex ads were still under the rubric of the Village Voice. So there's this massive protest, uh, maybe 40, 50 people on a very, very hot day. And when I was doing sort of the count of who was there, I realized that the majority of them were actually youth from this like junior varsity Christian fellowship. And so they were out there with what they represented as sort of a very social justice minded uh, opposition to prostitution, but then also saying things to me like, did you know that 89% of prostitutes would rather be doing anything else and want to be saved from it? And you know, I'm not disclosing to them actually, that wasn't my experience, right? I'm just having to write down what they're saying and listening to them. And um, you know, one of the other things they were engaged in was going and praying outside of businesses that they thought uh, were brothels based on looking at ads online. So they were actually spending as much time potentially as customers hanging out on back page, making indexes of where they think sex businesses are. So they can go pray outside of them. I said, God, what does this sound like? I mean, this reminds me of the anti-abortion movement who goes and prays outside of clinics. Um, and I've started looking into sort of the different projects that these religious right organizations are doing around sex trafficking, and some of them are being run by the same people who've created crisis pregnancy centers and other kinds of anti-abortion projects. So I'm, I'm curious about the connections there, and I'm curious about, um, you know, just from a, a story level, like how they understand what it is that they're doing. It is fascinating that the, the evangelicals feel like they need a woman's issue to appeal to women, um, and I'm just, you know, would love to spend more time hanging out in mega churches talking with these people. Melissa, your book is fundamentally about the idea of sex work as a kind of work. Tell me about how work is changing and how we need to think about work more generally. I'm so glad that I have access to amazing labor journalists also to help me think through this because I feel like for so long when we think about sex work, it's treated as an issue around like sexuality. So we're gonna think about you know sexual behavior and, and sexual expression or sexual identity as a way to understand sex work. And I had to learn from people who, who study labor and are much more focused on you know workers' rights to understand sex work as work. Um, and it's been a huge gift. And the kinds of things that that I think are changing right now that actually can help us understand you know, how sex work operates with much more nuance and clarity is the idea that our relationship to our work time and our non-work time is becoming more and more unstable. Like this hard and fast line between work and not work, work and play. Uh, one of the political theorists that I got a lot out of her work and quote her in the book, Kathy Weeks, has a book about trying to identify what is not work anymore. You know, like what, what is this, the part of our lives that's not about wage earning or not about producing value. Um, and one of sort of the, the, the sillier distillations of this is this project called Wages for Facebook, which is a, a riff on wages for housework. And uh, the, the premise is identifying the, the labor that we are doing when we're on Facebook, liking updates and hanging out um, and trying to figure out how would you put a dollar sign on that. So when I look at something like that and then I like go back to sex work and think, oh, this is really interesting. Like we are all struggling with the value of our time and of our labor and you know, a lot of work is becoming less material. And so that's making it a lot harder to sort of draw these boundaries. Um, and in a way it makes sex work seem much more literal and much more real and much more physical. You know when you're working and you know when you're not. Um, one of the things that I would love to work on next is the digital labor of sex work and the ways that, that sex workers um, 
you know, put time and energy and work into their online presence, into emailing with potential customers, and how because that's not sex, it's not physical sex, it's not often also thought of as the work of sex work. Um, and so I'd love to do more work around that and see the connections that sex workers digital labor has with other workers who are really defined by their digital labor. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.